Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Chatham House. Uh, we are still in the midst of war, of course, and as I'm sure you're aware, we've been covering this from a number of different angles in the last difficult two weeks for us all, and especially for my Ukrainian colleagues and our Ukrainian friends uh, back there. Uh, as I say, you can approach this from so many ways. We've done it from a legal angle lately, the humanitarian angle, the, hu the military angle, um, and quite simply, there's a, there's a lot of regional perspectives that need to be taken into account as well. Clearly, the Chinese perspective is important. We've covered the Americans quite substantially and will do in an event later this week. But we thought it was interesting to look south, considering Russia is looking east so much and the West is unavailable to it in so many ways, then Russia must also be looking south. And we're fortunate enough to have some very good perspectives um, from my Chatham House colleagues on this today. Um, joining us from the International Security Program is a senior research fellow, Bezo Anal, who will look at this, um, who will examine Turkey's perspective on recent events. After which, we'll hear from senior research fellow on the Middle East and North Africa program, uh, and Sanam Vakil, who will examine Iran. And finally, from my own Russian Eurasia program uh, colleague, Nikolai Kajanov, uh, is, who is based in the Gulf states, will look at it from a GEC perspective. So we'll do it in that order, if that's okay. I'll just remind you that we're on the record today um, and that uh, we'll take some questions in the Q and A. So just feed them in whenever you like and we'll get to that in approximately, approximately half an hour. So as I say, Turkey, Iran, GEC in that order. So thank you very much, all of you. We're all here physically inside Chatham House. Most of you are, are not. Um, that's the way we work these days, I suppose. Sebeza, hi, um, thank you. Um, Turkey, of course, has always had this extraordinarily complex, ambivalent, um, changing, vicissitudinal relationship uh, with Russia, sometimes with it, sometimes against it, sometimes at loggerheads, sometimes at peace, sometimes sharing ice cream, sometimes shooting each other down. And so, uh, you know, this is, uh, and, and so Turkey finds itself in a difficult position right now, just as, 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 as do all of the state, as all of what we're covering today. So uh, where does Turkey stand? How can it extricate itself? And I'm sure I'm going to ask this of all, of all, of all three of you. Um, will it choose sides? Will it be forced to choose sides? Can it get away with not choosing sides? Um, how much does it stand with Ukraine? Um, how much pressure will Russia put on? There's so much to explore. I, I, I've sort of been a bit prescriptive, but that's not intentional. You Obviously, you have a, a free range. It's freestyle for you from now on. Go for Amazing. it. Thank you very much, uh, James, uh, for organizing the event. So. Your questions are so well lit, and, and I'll start with what is Turkey's position, I guess this is your first question, and, and it's currently not choosing sides. Um, it's not taking sides on purpose. Some government representatives actually have been calling it as like a proactive balancing that Turkey is doing, um, indicating that Turkey does not need to take sides. That's what, that's what the government position is. Um, how long can Turkey co would continue to push for that position and of not taking sides really depend on, I think, three factors. Um, the first fa factor, I believe, is like how long the invasion will continue. Um, and then the second factor that I see is how much the Turkish interests and calculations change over the course of time. And then the third uh, point, I think, is really related to how much the Russian interest clashes with Turkey over Black Sea, but also in Syria as well, in, in the long term. Um, and so far, I think that Turkey has been following several um, policies and taking actions around that. Um, some of those actions, as you pointed out, are tilting towards Ukraine, and some of those are tilting towards Russia. Um, so if I start with like the ones that are tilting towards Ukraine, um, Turkey at the very beginning recognized Ukraine's territorial rights and, and political rights and, and, and called for Russian withdrawal. Um, and, and they're asking, I, mean, I think that what the government is doing is they're asking for a dialogue based, based approach and we can discuss that, so whether it's, it could be achievable or not. It's very similar what I see is the French way and the, the Israeli way of uh, dealing with this. Um, and they're calling for opening up humanitarian corridors for evacuations and for aid delivery purposes. Mm. And 
Um, at the, again, at the very beginning, I think one of the issues that came out on uh, regarding Turkey was the Montreal Convention, whether they were going to evoke it or not, and uh, we, we saw that it went ahead, Turkey went ahead with the, with this. Um, and, and currently, the, the Russian ships that are only belong to the Black Sea Fleet are allowed to station in uh, in the Straits. Uh, happy to explore, you know, what the mm. Montreal Con Convention is and talk about it uh, in the Q and A as well, because. I think there are a lot of uh, questions around it. Even in Turkey, it, it was not for sure what, what Turkey could have done. And I heard from former NATO colleagues that they had done some um, uh, apparently like simulations years ago where the Montreal Convention needed to be invoked and, and even NATO didn't know what that means. They need to get some legal advice around that. So uh, I think that, that points out to the ambiguity around, around, around the question. But at the moment, it's invoked, so that, that's, I think, a positive sign. And then um, Turkey continues to sell drones to Ukraine. Uh, and I think that the, a few years ago, the official count of this is 12 drones. Uh, these are Bayraktar TB2 type drones. Uh, that Turkey developed its indigenous uh, capability. Those dr drones were used in Syria by Turkey beforehand. Uh, Azerbaijan used it in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war. Uh, war. Um, and also, Turkey sold those drones to Poland as well. So there are th there are some Turkish drones in Poland, and there is a way for those drones probably to to pass to Ukraine if you know if that goes ahead. If Poland decides to sell uh, some armament. Uh, or send some armament, I should say, to Ukraine in the long run. Uh, also, lastly, I would say on the Ukraine side, as Turkey voted for the UN General Assembly resolution demanding the withdrawal of Russian forces uh, from Ukraine. So it was for that resolution as well. Um, if you look at the actions that are tilting towards Russia, uh, on the swift sanctions, Turkey indicated that they would not, they are not planning to join these sanctions. Uh, this is, I believe, mainly because of the dependency to the Russian contracts, uh, to the Russian energy sources as well, and Kolya knows more about this. Um, also, Turkey abstained from suspending Russia from Council of Europe. Um, and the reason that was shown back then was that if, if, if a suspension happens, then the Russian citizens would not be able to have uh, access to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, I think there was, a, I, in my personal view, that was a wrong decision because legally suspension does not mean expulsion. Mm -hmm. If you have expulsion, if you go ahead with that legally, mm -hmm. then that would have different consequences. Um, very shortly on the ramifications mm -hmm. to Turkey, if you, if you don't mind, yeah. I think that the, the war has and will have a big toll on Turkish economy, uh, specifically in the areas of food, agriculture, tourism and energy sectors. Um, as the Russian economy will shrink with, with SWIFT, the impact of SWIFT comes true, it's likely that the payments to the Turkish companies will be delayed. Um, there will be, there, what we're seeing also is like huge ramifications to the food sector. Just last week, the, the, the Turkish population was just like running to the supermarkets to buy sunflower oil. There were queues of like four hours, five hours that people were waiting as if it's wartime time <clears throat> in Turkey too. And the prices are going up as well. So, uh, so that, that, is, that is, I think, an interesting case because at the very beginning, Turkish people were saying, oh, this is not our war, we, we, we shouldn't take sides. But now what we're seeing, I think, is that this is everyone's war. You're going to be affected, at least on the economic side of the things that needs to be aware of. Two last points on the security risks. I think it's really important. Black Sea, I believe, is an existential security issue for Turkey. And we should point that out like as it is. And um, what I see what is happening today, in which we are not talking in, I think, Turkish media, is that encirclement of Turkey. Encirclement, if Odessa you know, falls down, the consequences of that to the security of Black Sea and Russia coming to literally coming to the border as a neighbor to, to Turkey at complete encirclement from, from up, but also from Syria with the Mediterranean fleet, with all the Russian forces that, are, that is up there, so encirclement from down as well. I see this as a huge security threat that Turkey really needs to consider as a long-term uh, interest. Um, and in the medium to long run, 
Turkey should look for alternative options uh, to gas dependency to Russia. Um, on the oil front, on, on the petrol and oil front, such dependency, Turkey has like dependency to Russia as well, but this is because of the sanctions to Iran. And, and Sanem uh, knows it much better than I do that JCPO talk, JCPOA talks are happening and that might come come from, so Iran might actually be implemented back into the system, which might mean that Turkey could actually shift its oil imports back from uh, Iran as it did before the sanctions, because it was 40 to 45% of the oil used to come from Iran. Because of the sanctions, it, it just switched to, to Russia. Um, so I would say that on the oil front, there is an alternative for Turkey, but on the gas front at the moment, there is no alternative. Thanks. No, thank you. That's absolutely fascinating and, and a really <laughs> extraordinary complex picture you paint. And I, I can't help thinking that, <laughs> that Turkey is, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't have any sympathy for Turkey's position because it has vacillated, as I say, over, over the years. But considering that it's a, a NATO country on the one hand, but, but, but at the same time so dependent on the other, and you, again, you look at the history, particularly of the fighter jet incident over Turkey in 2018, um, then, then it must be under enormous pressure from both sides. But then I suppose Turkey is quite capable of managing contradictions, right? Just as Russia itself is. It does. It does. Um, so I think the, the interesting thing with, between Turkey and Russia is people say that there's a strategic like, agreement that goes on. It's, it's really based on interest. It's, mm. it's based on interest from both sides. Uh, the, there were really downs of the Turkish-Russian relations. The one that you pointed out on the, the incident with the fighter jet, but also uh, the killing, the, the, the uh, assassination of the Russian ambassador in Turkey. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and historically as well, it is, it, it was, it's always up and down type of relation. Whenever someone tells me about deterrence and how deterrence, I generally mm -hmm. say, well, you need to look at Turkish-Russian relations. Right. Yeah. And was, you know, if you, if you want to think about deterrence, especially with the fighter jet incident. Fascinating. Thank you. We'll come back to you. And I see somebody's put in, in the chat some, some interesting statistics on Turkey's position. We'll get back to that, perhaps. Sanam, hi. Right. Um, in a way, everything that has been said about Turkey sort of applies, um, because historically its relationship with Russia has been so... Uh, up and down, swings and roundabouts. Um, and I've always regarded uh, Russia regarding Iran in a way in which we regard Russia as unreliable and unpredictable. Um, but I suppose the tables are now turned right now. And I, I'd be interested to, in your view as to how, to, to what degree of horror has uh, Iran's new government uh, given, considering, considering this. I, I assume it wasn't expecting it. Um, and, and clearly the implications uh, uh, you know, for the JCPOA talks are, are immense. But again, you know, Iran seems to be able to play both ends against the middle here. It's got it. It's it's well aware. It's it's it has this close relationship, and uh, for for reasons we can go into. But at the same time, we also know that, that there's an Israel dimension to this. The Israelis have been involved in diplomatic activity over the war right now. Now, so again, Iran seems capable of um, of riding this out uh, without without investing too much one way or another. Is that, is that fair? Uh, well, uh, I think that that's what we're really watching playing out right now uh, with regards to the JCPOA in Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you, you captured it right in saying that, you know, the sense is that Iran is an unpredictable actor. Um, but actually, I would sort of maybe push back on that and say uh, Iran is rather predictable. And perhaps we have to start looking at Iran as predictable. It's been, the Islamic Republic has been around for 43 years. Um, it's not a sort of new system. And regionally and in its relationships, it is trying to demonstrate that it is actually more predictable strategically, tactically, perhaps a bit more nimble. Um, and Iran is trying to uh, manage like, uh, the Gulf states are uh, multipolarity, which um, has come to the region, and they are aligned um, with Russia in trying to facilitate a great, a, a more multipolar Middle East. Um, but that multipolarity um, and, and a, a more reduced U.S. presence um, that is, I think, driving a lot of anxiety in the region. And I wouldn't let me caveat that the U.S. presence isn't reduced. The U.S. attention span is reduced. Um, 
that is driving Iran uh, to be uh, much more uh, uh, strategic in how it's uh, managing um, its tensions with Israel, its relationship with Turkey, uh, Attend, you know, uh, portending um, dynamics with the GCC <coughs> states, and much of it is very much hinged on the outcome of the Vienna talks that have been underway for 11 months now, um, that really appear to be on the precipice of resolution. Um, and, you know, there is this assumption, yes, you, Iran, uh, Russia ties um, have had their ups and downs, but there's an assumption, rightly so, that uh, Iran is more closely aligned with Russia and China, and, and both of those countries have sort of shielded and protected mm -hmm. Iran through the period of maximum pressure sanctions. But as we have seen over the past few days, um, Moscow has now sort of uh, thrown a wrench into these talks that we expected to be resolved now for a week, if not two, uh, in um, now demanding that their position and their support for the JCPOA uh, be protected um, from sanctions and, uh, um, and the like. And so Tehran is caught in a very interesting position, which I think is um, actually uh, really revealing of uh, Iran's um, objectives regionally. Uh, Tehran in the revolution put forward a, a policy of neither East nor West. And through maximum pressure uh, sanctions, um, Iran was shifting very decidedly towards the East. Um, it has signed this strategic agreement with China um, that is very much an MOU, but uh, you know potentially could develop uh, into stronger economic ties. It has sought to build that same sort of relationship with Russia, um, but here uh, with Moscow uh, sort of throwing a wrench into the JCPOA negotiations and, and with much uncertainty, you have the Iranian um, political establishment actually qu coming out quite strong over the past few days, first surprised, um, and then quite strong that they will not allow any external power to sort of uh, uh, compromise Iran's national interests. So again, you know, this is issue that Beza brought up of the national interest and of strategic interests are, uh, uh, trumping, if you will, uh, the uh, assumption of um, uh, ideological uh, connections uh, between uh, Tehran and Moscow or Tehran and Beijing or the axis of resistance, if you will. So um, it's going to be quite interesting to see how um, the remaining um, participants in the Vienna talks try to uh, let's say, develop the off-ramps for the JCPOA to go forward. And this is sort of where we are um, in, in limbo right now. The, the talks have broken down, not broken apart. They're just, um, there's a pause. Everyone has returned home to capitals. There are uh, discussions underway as to how to move forward. Um, and the United States has sta stated very clearly that they don't see um, uh, the sanctions on Russia compromising uh, their support for the JCPOA. Uh, so um, finding, uh, you know, workarounds to sell this very much matters. But um, at the same time, um, you know, this, of course, um, has spillover uh, into the Gulf and in, in uh, broader regional perspectives of what a restored JCPOA will mean for regional security. Um, Arab Gulf states see uh, the resurrection of the JCPOA as a um, threat to their interests. They worry very much that uh, the international community will turn their backs and forget about follow-on talks um, on, on regional security issues. And they fear that, um, rightly so perhaps, because you know history um, repeats itself in certain ways, that um, <laughs> there will be, uh, they will uh, lose any leverage they have over Iran to continue dialogue or to force um, these difficult, more difficult conversations that impact Gulf security interests, which I know uh, Kolya is going to talk about. But this is where the dynamics spill over into Yemen, uh, into recent attacks um, from uh, northern Yemen, um, from the Houthis into Abu Dhabi, sanctioning of the Houthis that just took place um, at the UN, and how um, also uh, this sort of transactionalism um, on these issues where Russia supported of the UAE in that vote led to Iran abstaining in the vote uh, um, at the UN uh, just on Monday, which was also a surprise. So you can sort of see this hedging um, and, and how, uh, you know, regionally all states are, are uh, trying to protect their national interests um, and, and see how this will all uh, play out. 
Thank you. For what it's worth, I think Russia understands these things. It realizes that these countries are in a difficult position and it's willing, you know, it's, it doesn't demand fully fledged support. Um, it doesn't demand uh, a vote in its favor at the UN and it accepts, uh, and whilst these things would be nice, um, it can, you know, you've got to be Eritrea or, or Belarus, quite frankly, to, to, to really go in all in for Russia. So I think, I think, you know, Iran isn't going to get marked down. So it, it seems reasonable to suggest that, 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 that these relations are relatively firm and, and actually more stable, of course, than, than Iranian um, Western relations. So we'll see how it plays out. And then maybe we could explore a little bit more about, um, about the, the, I'd like to explore with you maybe later, um, the Israel point that I mentioned and how they play that off against each other. And, and, and again, more on JCPO considering it's, it's so important and what, what that might look like if, if, if workarounds can be found. But I'll move on if I may. Kolya, welcome back to Chatham House. Thank you very much. Uh, you should know by way of introduction, ladies and gentlemen, that Kolya obviously was here and he now uh, does live in, 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 the, in the Gulf um, and his perspective will no doubt be increasing. I think it's probably the, the region that is understood least as far as this um, war is concerned, Kolya. We probably understand it least. It hasn't been publicised as much and people don't understand the connections. Obviously, there are connections. Um, I've heard of some Russians fleeing to the Gulf states uh, of late. Maybe you could do, um, uh, enlighten us upon that, although that's not really central to this, this point. Um, but clearly, I mean, maybe we shouldn't um, lump them all in together. And there seems to be some, um, perhaps you could help us to sort of um, compartmentalize or separate them out is what I really mean. Uh, so we could just look at the different, the different states' attitudes towards this, how badly they're affected by it, and how important it is. And I'll, afterwards, after you've spoken, Colin, I've got a, maybe a question for everybody, and then we'll move into Q and A. I can see we're, we're closing on half an hour in. But anyway, over to you, Colin. Well, uh, my pleasure is to, to offer my uh, view on what's happening in the Gulf with regard to uh, within the GCC. Sorry, mm -hmm. with regard to uh, mm -hmm. uh, war in Ukraine. And it's interesting that on the one hand, you're absolutely right. We see a certain movement of the Russians towards the GCC, and I already know that some of the Western powers are looking for Russian money unexpectedly appearing in the Gulf. Um, and especially they're trying to understand whether the, uh, this money can be prevented from flowing in any further. But uh, it's interesting that actually these events, they are not necessarily about Russia itself or the GCC relations to, 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 to Russia. Uh, we indeed saw that these countries being probably most uh, loyal allies of NATO and the West in the past, uh, mostly took a uh, neutral position that you correctly write in under the current circumstances can even be considered as a pro-Russian. So with the exception of probably Kuwait, uh, no other um, GCC member state clearly uh, said something in the support of Ukraine, otherwise that they want to see this conflict being over soon. And moreover, uh, the key players in the, within the GCC, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Qatar, they were quite clear that they don't want to uh, involve in this conflict or on any one side. And the reason here is only part, it can only be partly attributed to uh, Russian Russian efforts. So indeed, we see certain chemistry emerging between uh, the Russian leadership and the political elites of, of, of the GCC member states. We definitely saw some efforts to build up these relations uh, at the level of even the Russian regions and the uh, sub-regions of the GCC players, of course, in those countries where we can say about sub-regions uh, geographically wise. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, main reasons behind uh, these stunts, they are largely determined by domestic dynamics uh, in the GCC, uh, in the Gulf itself, mm -hmm. and by the dynamics of the Gulf relations with the United States and their vision of the changing role of the US in the region. So if uh, you may allow, I just uh, name briefly those drivers that probably uh, can bail the GCC states not simply not, uh, uh, not only to withdraw from the uh, support of uh, Ukraine, but also uh, compel them to be silent in response to the Western request to replace Russia in oil and gas markets. Um, first of all, uh, if we come to the economic side, uh, definitely we see, for instance, the issue of OPEC on the side of the uh, oil producers. Uh, they know that it was quite difficult to build up the um, uh, to, 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 to build up certain line of uh, behavior within the OPEC, and they don't want to ruin that. Uh, one of the unspoken rules that are currently uh, dominating the decision-making process in OPEC Plus, that uh, the members should not exploit the uh, political or economic issues of other members for their profit. 
So that's why they are not that vocal, not, they are not that open uh, in their wish or in their desire, even if it exists, to replace uh, Moscow in Europe, for instance, or in Asia. Uh, second, uh, there is also the question of uh, personal economic capacities of these countries. Some of them, they simply don't have such a capacity to replace Russia right here, right now in the uh, oil and gas market, like for instance, Qatar. Uh, the, for the others, um, the, an attempt to replace them and to uh, build up a higher oil output, for instance, as in the case of Saudi Arabia, would mean the disclosure of the real capacity of Saudi to produce oil. And these capacities might be a little bit lower than uh, declared, which is not that good in terms of the, for instance, IPO of Saudi Aramco that is going to happen so sometime soon. So that's why they prefer to, uh, to uh, uh, at least to adopt the wait and see tactics for now. Um, and thirdly, as I mentioned, uh, there is uh, a certain dynamics of uh, political, uh, domestic political attitude to this conflict. Uh, for the Gulf states, um, the, the conflict over Ukraine and how it is covered in media uh, is, uh, is pursued slightly different than for us. Uh, because for them, there is a huge question why the West is helping so actively to Ukraine, and it ignores those multiple conflicts and multiple issues that are happening in the Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Uh, and partially, the Gulf states are also following this uh, idea of a certain hypocrisy on the side of the West. Uh, not saying that um, the uh, conflict in Ukraine, at least at the very beginning of it, was largely uh, conceded by the uh, GCC um, decision makers uh, through the lens of the Syrian conflict. So for them, uh, the question of Russian dominance on the battleground, at least within the first days, was not um, was completely uh, clear. So they believe that it will be a short-lived military operation that will end up with the Russian supremacy on the battlefield. And so far, even in spite of the fact that we see a heavy resistance on the Ukrainian side, these narratives partially dominate the perception in the Gulf. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, there is a substantial, uh, well, disappointment with the United States and their presence in the Gulf, with the United, uh, United States foreign policy towards the Gulf. Uh, the GCC states are not trusting to the US administration as much as they trusted before, uh, let's say, um, Trump. Or even, uh, uh, or e even before that. So Trump administration and Biden administration, they definitely undermine the belief that uh, the Gulf states should stand up together with the West right now, uh, because they don't know what will happen after another round of elections uh, in, the, in the US, and they think that they might suddenly be left alone against Russia with the US changing their attitudes or even putting additional pressure on some of them in the Gulf. So that's why they try to adopt this wait and see tactics. But with uh, having said all of this, we also need to apply the um, uh, uh, time framework to this conflict in order to understand where it's, it leads. So from the short term perspective, we uh, will largely see GCC states being neutral. Mm -hmm. But if we adopt uh, the long-term perspective, we can still see some options for the GCC states to change their attitude. This will be, of course, determined by several factors. First of all, the ability of uh, the West, the United States and Europe, to impose harsh sanctions on Russia. So if, we'll, if we see uh, Russia being cut from the SWIFT, if we see Russia being largely cut from uh, the international oil market, then uh, the Gulf players will definitely need, will need to reconsider their healthy relations with Russia, whether they should profit from it or whether they should join to the, to the West. The second uh, is, of course, the situation in the battlefield. So if we see Russia being uh, stopped or even defeated, uh, and if we see, for instance, Russia being prevented from dominating the uh, um, Spain, uh, the um, uh, skies over Ukraine, then definitely uh, for the Gulf states, this will be a sign that the situation is not going to develop in accordance to the Syrian scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's where they might think about reconsidering options. And finally, while definitely they don't want to uh, ruin their relations with Russia, while, while they don't want to go against their strategy of the uh, uh, hedging their international relations, something what was mentioned by, by Sanam, uh, they also don't want to miss economic opportunities. 
and they will still exploit uh, from the Russian absence in the oil market, from uh, the European will to change the suppliers, to diversify the suppliers. But it will happen not immediately due to the uh, uh, production limits that exist, and also due to the fact that they would like to present this replacement of Russia not as a political move, but rather as a process of natural transformation of economic conditions in the market. And that's something what we have already seen after 2014 and annexation of the Crimea. Of, uh, Crimea. Uh, the share of uh, GCC states in oil and gas market, especially of Eastern Europe, started to grow. And in January, Saudi Aramco signed quite important agreements together with the uh, Polish oil consumers uh, with regard to the possibility of uh, Saudi entry in the petrochemical market of uh, Poland and with the possibility uh, to use Poland as a, a springboard to uh, move further on in the Eastern European countries. And this in the long run will definitely uh, mean, will mean how, say, the decrease of the Russian presence. Not to say that the Western sanctions will naturally limit the capacities of Russia to develop its oil and, uh, oil and petrochemical sector, which will lead to the decrease in the capacities of this sector to uh, um, um, ensure the Russian's presence in the, markets, in, in, in the markets not only in Europe, but also in Asia, uh, the priority market for the oil and gas producers of the GCC. So that means that they will also, in the long run, will acquire uh, additional possibilities to fill in the gap that will be created by the absence of Russia. So in a nutshell, uh, in the short term, we definitely won't see the majority of the Gulf states being uh, supportive uh, for the Ukrainian case. In the long run, the political attitude towards Ukraine may, may change, but we will definitely see the GCC states trying to exploit the economic problems of Russia for their own sake, though they won't present it as a kind of an attempt to uh, challenge Russia or to be a political rival of them. Mm -hmm. And I'll be happy to answer your questions, as usual. As usual. Thank you so much, Collier, and, and thank you, everybody. And <laughs> guys, I mean, what, it, what, what this what has brought out to me in, in this conversation, what's well, about to be a conversation, um, is uh, in a way, you know, it's all politics, man. I mean, there's, there's, no, nobody seems to think about Ukraine in all this, right? Uh, it doesn't seem to be an actor that's considered much by anybody. It may be a little bit more so by Turkey because of a pre-existing relationship there, but but uh, but really. On the one hand, you know, they sense opportunity, um, but at the same time, you know, they're quite prepared to drop Russia if it's losing. No one wants to be seen as a loser. Um, and uh, it's, that's, that's the common thread that, I, that I, I saw through all your presentations for what it's worth. Just before I, just, and I, maybe I'll come back to that, but uh, just to say, um, in the interim, uh, now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, to, to ask your questions. I can hardly see any on my screen, so please do bring them in. But also, there are six real people as opposed to 50 virtual people in this room. So hopefully the real people in the room can uh, will ask uh, 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 vocal oral questions. Um, but, but I mean, so whoever wants to take this, and then by the way, I'm sure you don't have to compartmentalize yourselves into Iran, GEC and Turkey. Um, I'm sure you can shift between the three, you're all more than capable. So choose, pick and choose as you will, but is this all seen? I mean, I know, I mean in the West there's a sophisticated debate reasonably sophisticated debate about uh, whether this, uh, you know, how this all started, um, you know, uh, agency, blame, if you prefer, um, that, you know, this is, you know, Russia's, you know, imperial ambitions, uh, you know, Soviet Union Mark II, all that sort of stuff. That doesn't sound very sophisticated when I put it like that. And at the same time, and there's the, the idea that the West has indeed antagonized Russia over the years and, the, the, and there's a, uh, and has you know tried to put the boot in and keep it down. Uh, I just I just be interested. To, to, it's a very basic question, but but I'd just be interested to know a little bit more about is there is there any debate about this whatsoever in Turkey, Iran, and in in, in the Gulf, or, or is it perhaps more than the West has <laughs> the West has caused this? It's antagonized, it's antagonized Russia, and it's kind of got itself to blame in a way. But maybe there's a, maybe there's a more uh, nuanced debate that I'm simply not aware of. Any of you? Shall I start it? So I was in Turkey in the last couple of weeks, so I had the chance to actually listen to the Turkish news, however grim it is. Um, in the Turkish news, the way, and of course it changes from one news media to another, but the general view is that, yes, Russia is on the wrongdoing here, 
but what about West? Mm -hmm. West has the same imperialist right? mm -hmm. uh, approach as Russia did for many years. Mm -hmm. And they're giving examples of Iraq, for instance, in 2003. And then, so the, the way that I think, I would say the Turkish population, and I'm really generalizing in here, mm -hmm. but most of the yeah. people in, in Turkey really thinks is that, yes, Russia is the problematic actor in here, but West is not as better than Russia mm. in most of the security issues that we had seen. Mm. And that's also why I think that, that, that the, Tur the Turks have this dual position when it comes to NATO as well, or trusting to NATO and the allies versus sometimes trusting to Russia. And I'm using trust with a small T in here rather than you know, like yeah. a big T. Uh, yeah. Sonam. Interesting. Okay, so it's slightly more sophisticated, but then I would have expected that from Turkey. <laughs> what about Iran? Well, I think there has been a debate in Iran. It started out um, quite uh, pro, um, <coughs> or, you know, as, as, as I said, critical of um, the US and NATO, and, and that NATO was provocational, and this is sort of justifies Russia's position. But um, the Iranian population obviously has a bit more of a nuanced view of what's happening. And since the war has broken out, you've seen a debate emerge um, among the press, um, on social media, with a lot more empathy, obviously, um, to, uh, towards Ukrainians um, okay. in Iran. And I think that that explains also the progressive um, uh, neutrality, if you will, uh, independence that the Iranian um, political establishment might, might want to demonstrate going forward, also in the context of the JCPOA. And Russia, um, Iranian relations have been up and down, as you mentioned, and, and this uh, war uh, evokes memories of Iran's own history of tensions with Russia, which as, as recently as, you know, you know 1945, they, they see um, themselves having been occupied. Anytime something goes wrong with regards to Russian um, Iranian relations, they bring up the Treaty of Turkmenchi from the 19th century. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, sort of idea of history is, is long and, it, you know, it's still quite raw. So, you know, the debate is there. But of course, from a security and a national interest perspective, um, Russia and Iran you know, manage their relations in a transactional and pragmatic way with regards to Syria, with regards to Turkey, with mm -hmm. regards to mm -hmm. tensions in the north between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And so Iran knows that it has to navigate all of those dynamics um, and over a longer period of time uh, in, in how the region itself will change. Um, with regards to concerns of the United States, as as Kolya brought out, and and um, you know the diminished confidence that um, American partners have towards Washington, um, Tehran uh, you know sees itself more closely um, reliant um, or cooperative um, with with Russia uh, rather than anyone else in the region. Absolutely, how's the debate in in your region, Kolya? Well. Uh... Again, it's the GCC is in separate part of the, the Persian Gulf, so to, to a certain extent they are uh, echoing something that's uh, discussed in, in Iran, and so the substantial part of the debate is also to what extent Russia have uh, ha has the right to do what it, it has done. So it's also partly echoing the I guess the Turkish discussion that look the West has been doing it for a long time getting intervened in, as in other countries and why Russians cannot mm, the right to do this. Uh, but if we're talking about the very top elites uh, of the Gulf, uh, of the, the Qataris, of the Saudis themselves, uh, they're quite close actually and they're trying not to make this uh, discussion too vocal uh, just because they want to stay neutral for mm -hmm. now and see how the situation is going to develop. Uh, which makes them quite pragmatic uh, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, again, whether they want it or not, they are partially playing in the Russian interest. So, for instance, without naming a country, if you allow me, uh, I know that one of the GCC players basically uh, forbade the Ukrainians to uh, wire the um, fin financial resources in the support of their army or in the support of the, the humanitarian issues. Um, in Ukraine, which was partly done, I guess, also not in order not to infuriate Russia. Absolutely. I got to say, before we move on to questions, that 
I, I think working in a think tank for so long as I have, that uh, I, I kind of think we should ban the word pragmatic. It's a, it, I always when whenever anyone mentions it, I know I know what you mean. But, but I, 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 I know, but it's, it's, it just sounds so much nicer, doesn't it? Than pragmatic, and I think you've all mentioned it. Certainly, you you guys have. I can't remember Beza. Um, <laughs> don't worry, because I, I, I can. Might I, have, but I but, um, not today. No, no. Can I tell you why we use it? Yeah, because the assumption is always that it's ideological in the region, and okay. that um, countries develop their ties based on sectarian mm -hmm. or based on some worldview that seems illogical. Right. And so I think that, at least from my perspective, yeah. I reinforce this idea of pragmatism because it's generally not uh, necessarily ideological. Not ideological, it's kind of commercial come... Yes, it's opportunistic, yeah. okay. it's transactional. That's a good point, but I still think, I, I always feel, uh, this is a sort of almost an editorial point, yes. but, 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 but we, we need to articulate it a bit better as, as, as us as analysts. Um, right, uh, there's about, I don't know, half a dozen questions on my screen. Almost all of them are about Turkey Baser, so you may have your work cut out for you. Um, and at least one, <laughs> at least one physical one in the room. Um, but uh, so I'll, I'll pretty much I'll I'll try and group them a little bit together, but we'll go through them one at a time. And we've got I see, where's that? Um, about fifty minutes. Um, so let me give some stats at you, um, mm -hmm. Baser, because it's but it's not a question here, but I'll make it into a question, which is that um, uh, Dr. Kara, uh, Dr. Tugbakara. Uh, is saying that you need to you need to understand the, the realities, the, um, the, the the raw stats to, to get this relationship, and to see where Turkey's coming from. Uh, so we're seeing that Russia supplies forty percent of Turkey's gas, twenty five percent of its oil, and Russia meets two thirds of Turkey's wheat needs. Um, and meanwhile, Turkey's going through a bad time anyway with high inflation and unemployment rates. So I think the implication of the question is is that when it comes to this sort of when it comes to a balancing act that but Turkey is in a pretty weak position as far as Russia is concerned. We saw that again back in 2018, and that really there's not, you know, in spite of its, um, not Western inclinations, but but the Western um, groupings, if you like, then uh, then there's, there's not much Turkey can do if it wants to survive. And I think another question was, was, was you know, does this, does, this, does this weaken or consolidate Erdogan's position? There's a lot more to be said on Erdogan, but not now. But that's what the, but, but, um, but yeah, so, I mean, the, the so, raw stats. Yeah, the, the raw stats are, are, are correct. And it actually is in line with, with my original yes, thinking about, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, there is dependency to Russia. The way that I, I put it forward is that the, the oil dependency and gas dependency needs to be separated because we could get the, the I mean, Turkey could get the oil from Iran. If the sanction, you know, mm -hmm. the, if we could mm -hmm. go ahead with the JCPOA, so mm -hmm. there is an alternative route, at least in the short run, which is the twenty-five percent, right? Um, on the inf inflation rates, I, I think Tuba didn't put the inflation rates figure there, but uh, the figure for the two thousand twenty-one uh, rate, I would say, annual inflation rate was fifty-four percent. Just to put it, just to put it into a context in here, in the UK, we're talking about seven to eight percent of inflation, right? And uh, I checked Goldman Sachs and what they are thinking for a 2022 inflation rate. And they're they are being actually very cautious and they're saying that probably it's going to be 45%. If you ask the, Tur if you ask the Turkish population this, uh, this, this same question, they would say that the actual inflation rate is not being uh, published mm -hmm. and that there are hidden figures and that actually the inflation rate is way more than 54%. Because the way that it is, the inflation rate is calculated is quite different than some of the other groups in Turkey calculating it. So there is no agreement, but at least the lower end of the spectrum is 54%. It's huge inflation. So on top of that, add the, you know, the, the, the dependency to wheat and so on. Uh, that's also the reason why you know, Turkey can't get afford to take sides. When SWIFT happen, happens, Turkey can't take sides on that. It's not the same as Europe, right? Europe, the inflation rate in Europe, even in the UK, is not as high as Turkey. Mm -hmm. the, the instability in the country, economic instability is huge. So that's, uh, that's an unfortunate timing, I yeah. would say. Although, of course, in Europe, of course, countries are more dependent, closer to Russia, um, more dependent on its gas up to, you know, pretty much 100%, and yet they're still taking a very um, anti-Russian line. So it's not necessarily because of that, but uh, so I think, but I take a... Yeah, I don't, I don't actually, I haven't checked the figures on the gas dependency mm -hmm. on Russia. I, I don't want to speculate on that. If, if a participant mm -hmm. could actually check it, it would be good. I, I'm thinking it's 60% or so. It's not too low. Yeah. 
there's no transition country, so it comes directly from Russia to Turkey. It doesn't go through yep. Ukraine. There's no security risk yep. in that front. It goes Good through point. the under underwater uh, pipelines to Turkey. But there's the supply security risk, right? right. If Russia cuts it off uh, the gas, then what, what happens? And it didn't, yeah, that's the risk. Okay, let's. Yeah, do you want to say something quickly? Yeah, just yes, if mm -hmm. I may. Yes, uh, the problem of uh, Turkey energy security uh, and its dependence on Russia, it can be solved at least. As yeah. The dependence itself it can be degraded. But again, we are returning to this question of uh, pragmatism, opportunism. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the question is about the price. I mean, those alternatives that can come, for instance, from Qatar, uh, they, of course, are going to be uh, slightly expensive than uh, the uh, natural gas received <coughs> from, 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 from the Russian side. So if we see the changes in the, in the market dynamics or if we see the political will to pay more on the Turkish side, this question can be settled. But again, the, the, the question is about the time framework. So it's not going to happen immediately, but more, prob most probably in Turkish side case, it might be take like a year or two. Right. Yeah. Two, three years, uh, I've spoken to an energy analyst yesterday, yep. they say two to three years time it could be sold, but not in a short time frame. Mm. And Turkmenistan is another... I'm trying uh, to be you optimist, know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you are optimistic. But also, in, when you look at it, there are pipelines that are already there, so you can use the existing infrastructure, actually, even if you want to move it to the Eastern Europe and so on, right? You can, sure. you can move it through Turkey, so there are some opportunities. Uh, um, there, there will be excessive natural gas definitely on the Egyptian side, on the Israeli yeah. side, mm -hmm. but it's the hostage, of course, of the political discourse yeah. between Ankara and neighbors. Yeah. Well, the U.S. also killed the uh, killed the one that was the Israel, coming through the, through Israel. I think it was the Americans who. East Med, uh, but it was largely killed because of the, 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 the economic cost considerations. And that doesn't make sense. Good sorry. debate. Let's move oh, on. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, debate is what we want here. I like the discussion element of this. Um, and in fact, I'm going to increase that now by turning to the, you know, a real person in the room, uh, my uh, my colleague Mathieu Boulek. Mathieu, I'm hoping that it's not a question for Bezer because Bezer is so going to be he's overworked already and has got a lot more to come. But uh, we'll see. It's up to you. Yeah. It's a question for everyone, actually, um, in the region. I'd like to come back to what you said, Kolya, on the toxicity threshold of acceptance. Um, is there a pragmatic political threshold in all the region whereby Russia would actually become so toxic for good balancing in the region, thinking about Turkey, thinking about Iran as well, uh, whereby these, these, all of these countries would basically have a reassessment of their relationship with Russia and the way they keep their relationship with Russia. Mm -hmm. And on the energy front, Will there be, do you think, and, and Sanam specifically to you, do you think there would be a sort of wake-up call in the international community that actually Iran is actually not that bad a player when it comes to energy security <laughs> because of Russia becoming so toxic for our own interest? Thanks, uh, there could be a yeah. sort of catch-up or reassessment. Yeah, yeah. So linked questions, really, they are, aren't they, in a way? So, okay, but it's the toxicity question. Why don't we go in reverse order, so to speak, and then you, you go first. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, uh, as for perception, I guess it's the issue of awareness yeah. and the ability to raise it. Uh, I need to praise the activities, for instance, of the Ukrainian embassy in Doha. They were ready to speak in the very first day when it all started. And the Russian embassy has always just slept over the beginning of the war. I guess mm -hmm. they still don't know that it started. Uh, <laughs> so and someone needs to inform them. Uh, Special limits operation. Yeah, 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 of course. It, 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 Exactly. Uh, so uh, from this point of view, uh, the more we are talking about this war, the more we are talking about atrocities that are happening on the ground, then definitely uh, this will be affecting the thinking in, in the Gulf. Because uh, we need to understand that for the GCC, it's a distant front, it's a distant area, and they are receiving information sometimes from the distorted channels. And they're still in the process of forming their final attitude towards this. So the um, uh, increase in awareness is something which is extremely important. Uh, on Iran, I don't want to steal this question from, from Sanam. Uh, but let me just tell about the technical yeah, aspects. Yeah. So uh, the fact that the market is already ready for the increase in oil production in Iran, and it's not going to affect the uh, Russian interest that much just because Iran is unable to bring that much of oil in the market. Mm -hmm. And even if it wants, it most probably go to the neighbors or to the pet petrochemical sector, the, which is actively developing in Iran and allows to earn much more money than just the experts of raw materials. So from this point of view, for me, uh, the, the specter of Iranian oil, which is haunting all capitals in Europe, is just a huge bogus, which has nothing to do with the reality. Right, thanks. So Sanam, let me give Matthew's question a bit more oomph by saying that 
you know, if, if the Russians were to release, let's just say, a low-yield nuclear weapon in Ukraine somewhere, maybe as a way of uh, showing that they can, they can do it and getting the West to de-escalate, would that change your thinking in Iran, bearing in mind Iran's own nuclear issues? Yeah, that would be an interesting one to watch play out in Tehran because Iran um, will continue, would likely continue to um, see uh, that move as a defensive one or it would pitch it as a defensive one right. because it sees NATO uh, expansion mm -hmm. yeah. as a threat and, and, and this is how it sort of, um, it, its worldview is formed in the context of this <coughs> war. But at the same time, you would probably have Tehran coming out and saying, this is why we need to negotiate broader um, frameworks on right. uh, nuclear weapons uh, that would bring in other countries in the region, mm -hmm. that would be, uh, even be broader internationally, because we don't want nuclear weapons either. We don't have a, a nuclear weapons program. And so they would take such a crisis mm -hmm. and uh, you know repackage it and instrumentalize it for their own purposes. Um, Iran is concerned. Uh, that, uh, you know, if the JCPOA talks unravel, that other regional states will uh, make advancements on their uh, on their nuclear programs. And, and so that is an issue um, on Iran's radar, as is, of course, um, greater weapons sales to regional states uh, that could, um, uh, you know, shift the balance. Iran has asymmetric defense capabilities, but as the Gulf states are purchasing drones and missiles um, alongside uh, conventional military capabilities, of course, there are risks for Iran to consider as well. But I think that there is this issue of toxicity is interesting on both sides of the Gulf. It's, you know, Iran, first of all, um, I don't think can ever really be rehabilitated among uh, the international community because right. the nuclear issue is one in the long list of the Iran file. So if that issue is resolved, then we have to move on and there will be immense pressure um, to uh, start looking at the missile um, imbalances and dynamics in the region followed, uh, and, and this is in no particular order, the, the the regional file, um, which will require um, Gulf states, and I think that um, uh, we, we might see this unfolding quite soon, Gulf states and Iran um, to build on uh, the past, you know, two years of dialogue that has been underway, you know, uh, between <clears throat> Turkey and the UAE, uh, you know, the Al-Ula agreement, uh, seemingly resolved GCC tensions, but there still seem to be some underlying di dynamics that haven't um, mm -hmm. uh, really been resolved uh, between uh, Gulf states as well that need to um, be invested in Iran, Saudi, UAE, Iran, uh, and of course, you know, how does the Abraham Accords fit into all of this? So all of this will play out under the auspices, and, and I think this is where I want to bring in the Gulf perspective, just to double on the other side, it, the US presence is, uh, or the, you know, the sentiment of the GCC states uh, towards the United States is, is one that is often uh, misunderstood or uh, misread in Washington. And I think that this vote um, uh, or, or, you know, the shifting sort of GCC position uh, towards Russia um, has raised a lot of eyebrows, if not anger, um, and and there needs to be a bit of soul searching in those relationships that I think will play out over the coming weeks, if not months, um, as oil prices are uh, increasing, as President Biden is supposedly thinking of going to Saudi Arabia, and that would require resolution of, of you know, broader issues with the crown prince. Um, that still remain on the agenda. But I, I very much see GCC anxiety um, and, and their position on, on this crisis as driven through Washington. And, and, and this could be an opportunity for them to sort of try to reforge um, uh, or have greater latitude on security issues um, as part of, uh, of, of the war and that dynamic. Well, can, can I just say for, for a brief moment? Uh, just to, to illustrate what was said, for instance, there is one of the explanations why the UAE abstained from supporting the resolution was their uh, uh, disappointment that actually the United States provide no reaction or real support for uh, the shelling of uh, the UAE territory by the Houthis. Mm -hmm. So, and for them, there was a just stark difference between how the, the West reacted in the case of, of Ukraine and how little was attention paid to those security threats and concern, concerns uh, that are connected to the Gulf and specifically to the UE. So it was rather a signal to be sent.
It's a transitional well, relationship that Sanem mentioned earlier. Is like if you do this, then we are seeing the consequences or the other side's reaction and the UN side on the negotiations, which is crazy. Yeah. There's no compartmentalization at the moment, and I think right. that should be created. So, Beza, then returning to Matthew's question, then um, does the toxic does does possible increased toxicity uh, counter your answer to the previous question about the dependency? Well, I mean, so it's like, when would Russia become too toxic? Yes. Right. That's mm -hmm. that's uh, mm -hmm. that's the question. I see. I see Black Sea as the key mm. for Turkey, and, and that is really the the button that that Russia should not push. And because historically, from from the years of Turkish history that we have read from you know when we were kids, we've always learned that the Russian ambition of coming to the the, the warm waters of Black Sea. That's like, that is how it has been like, kind of like told, told us in, in a historical sense. So if you ask people of my age or like, you know, elder, they would say the same thing. Black Sea is super important. Security of the Straits are super important. If you push that button, then, then you will see a response probably from Turkey. So, and I think Russia knows that. Mm -hmm. But the problem, of course, from the Russian end is that they would, probably try, and that's what we see from 2014 onwards, is Russia testing, right? Continuously mm -hmm, testing mm -hmm, until this mm -hmm, point. Mm -hmm. So we might see Russia testing Turkey on the Black Sea coming forward for years, and, and then we'll, we'll see what comes out of that. The worst thing that could happen is that Russia will have the free, you know, find a way of the free passage and, and link up its Black Sea fleet with the Mediterranean. That is, I think, the, the biggest worry uh, that we should be thinking of. Mm -hmm. And in Turkey right now, there is also consideration of a new canal. It's called the Istanbul Canal, which is like an undersea canal. If, if, if that canal goes ahead, then the Montreal Convention does not hold as well. Right. So at the moment, there are so those considerations is, uh, that in Turkey happening economically, mm -hmm. that, that canal is really good and that the government is pushing forward to that. But then now we realize that Montreal Convention is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. I see. While you're on a roll, yeah. Lisa, Please, um, go I'll, ahead. I'll hit you another one and then I promise to move away. Um, so um, the world's looking for a, a broker, not necessarily mm -hmm. an honest one, a negotiator. I mean, I, I guess Mr. Erdogan is on the long list. I don't know about the short list. Um, uh, we could possibly think of a few others. It's, it's hard, of course, because to find, to find somebody who both sides will trust. Is that Mr. Erdogan at all? Do you think he's up for the job or is this a non-starter? I mean, how do you, how do you see his, his role as, um, well, in mediation efforts? I don't think it's up to him. I think mm -hmm. it is Putin who is choosing who is the, mother, uh, the, the mediator or should be the mediator. And I don't think that Putin would agree anything lower than the United States being involved mm -hmm. in that discussion. Or like, I don't think that Erdogan China. is the, it's all China. Yeah. So the, 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 pro the problem of the mediator role and Erdogan having that role as well is that you can't you can't say anything that's against what NATO has already said. As, sure. a, as a NATO sure. ally, you need to stick with what NATO has already agreed, and all, in that front, so your hands are a bit tight. Yeah. Uh, and, and NATO will will also you know tell Turkey that don't make any promises mm. that is not in line with NATO strategy. So. Yeah. Uh, well, well, so if you ask Macron. But I don't think Macron can also hold yeah. a mediator role as well. Yeah. I mean, well, I've never sensed that, that Erdogan is is that compliant towards NATO strategy. So therefore, I, that wasn't I, 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 that never struck me in that way. But I was more thinking in a way. I suppose he'd be he sort of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, he'd be trusted by neither. <laughs> Rather than, oh, he, I think Putin and Erdogan probably have good relations. I mean, I, I, I can see that they're having uh, hour-long conversations yeah. each time they meet on the meeting. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they exactly talk about, of yeah. course, but they have hour-long conversations. Uh, Macron has two, three hours uh, conversations with Putin as well. Um, the, the answer to that question probably is, <coughs> it, would any mediation effort result in a positive manner or not? Mm -hmm. do, do we expect that happening? 
That's at the nice moment, I don't think that <laughs> we're not would. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So we're yeah. not there. So we, it won't be Erdogan. It won't be, any, you know, it won't be others as well. I don't mm-hmm. think there is a there is a good call on that. Great. Right. I can give you at least the option of having a rest while I broaden it out to another question on Syria. Um, and you can you know, fight over it. Or something. Um, uh, so the question here is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's at the heart of Turkey-Russia relations. It's the heart of Iran-Russia relations. Um, and it's where the focus has been in, 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 in recent years. So, I mean, how does, what, is, what does the war on Ukraine mean for the not going away Syria situation? I mean, it goes away from the media, but it doesn't, it's not really gone away, of course. How does, how does this affect things, considering, you know, I don't want to bring it back in, I was trying to give you a rest base, but considering that Russia and Turkey being on opposite sides here, um, does, does, this, does this mean that, uh, that Syria, again, I don't know what I'm trying to say, is it is it is it is it is it going to is it going to go further away from us? Or is it is it is it going to come back into us? I mean, it's, it still seems pretty secure in what it is. I mean, we know the Americans have been beaten out by the Russians in Syria. Um, what's the Syrian play here? I'm looking at you, Sanam, but it's not necessarily fair. I could look at anybody. Um, I mean, I can start. Um, yeah. I think that there was uh, always a hope that uh, Russia and Iran could be split in Syria, um, mm. and I think perhaps. Um, there again might be some hedging underway with you wanted me to bring Israel into this um, picture um, and Israel's uh, reluctance uh, to uh, be you know, condemn Russia right away, I think is a reflection of um, uh, security dynamics in Syria for Israel. Um, so, you know, more hedging, uh, but this could uh, be an opportunity for Tehran to reassert uh, what was looking like a, mo- a weakened hand in Syria and, and lead to greater cooperation uh, between uh, Russia and Iran. Um, at, but Russia at the same time has been uh, quite mindful of Israeli red lines in, in Syria. And so um, it will be very interesting to see how uh, that triangle is navigated and if Russia will have the ability to uh, maintain those red lines uh, going forward. Um, but I, I could very well see uh, Tehran as an opportunistic player, uh, <laughs> capitalizing on these uncertainties um, to reassert itself more visibly. Um, and Tehran is opportunistic um, and predatory. And so it will always look for chaos and opportunities to move, up, <clears throat> move forward. Um, so in that space, I think uh, that could be quite challenging also for Gulf interests as Gulf states are slowly um, building back ties with the Assad regime. Um, this could constrain um, uh, those ties as well. You know, it's a space that we really have to watch and continue to sort of study. Well, uh, from my point of view, um, on one hand, it's quite difficult to predict right now how the situation will be developed around Syria because I guess it will all be determined how the war in Ukraine will be unfolding. Uh, on the one hand, I guess for now we'll see it, uh, I mean, the Russian activities in Syria are quite limited uh, due to natural, financial, uh, human resources limits. But on the other hand, Russia will continue exploiting Syria and Syrian issue uh, to both shape the uh, uh, views of Russia in the region. And what's more important, and we've already seen it in the case of the GCPOA, it will try to make the West talk to Russia mm. by exploiting these issues, showing that whether you like it or not, you will still need to communicate with us, which might probably uh, imply certain changes in the Russian approaches to Syria, where it will try to make the life of the, the, the United States and their allies a little bit more complicated. Mm-hmm. So that should not be excluded as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I completely agree to Kolya on this. On the, on the t- Turkish side, I think Syria, I mean, the, the whole neighborhood has changed so much at this point for Turkey that it's, yeah. it's like a moving block at all times. But Turkish position on Syria has been clear, and and it's it's not going in line with the Russian position. So mm-hmm. coming back to that question about what would push you know mm-hmm. the lines, mm-hmm. Syria might also be an area that they could also come really? head to head again in the future. Because it never has, but it, you um, think it might. Well, t- t- Turkish, I th- I think that the the way that 
Syria looks at the issue or the, the regime looks at the issue mm -hmm. from the pro-Russian uh, perspective, mm -hmm. they see Turkey and the U.S. as the violators of, right. of uh, you know, getting into mm -hmm. Syria. So that, that position, I think, is quite clear. And the Turkish position is that they would never allow a, a Kurdish government formed in Iraq and Syria mm -hmm. and so on. And their position over there is also clear. So um, it, we'll, we will see, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, Syria okay. is another area, yeah. OK, thanks. Right, ladies and gents, uh, what is it? Uh, 25 minutes left. I've got at least one question for each of you, as in on your specific regions. And then, then a question for you all together. So let's um, yeah, let's do Iran first, Sanan, if that's okay. But you can come in, of course, everybody else, as I say. Um, <clears throat> uh, is Russia concerned about an Iranian nuclear deal, whilst Russia itself is under sanctions, may lose oil market share, uh, and may be harmful to its own economic interests to keep a deal from materialising? If there's a nuclear deal. Um. Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Lots of speculation on that. And Kali and I were discussing that today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More speculation. And I'm sure he has something to chime in. I don't think it's in Russia's interest to let this deal fall to the wayside. Right. It's invested diplomatic energy um, at the highest levels. Um, but uh, at, at, at the same time, um, you know, a second front crisis, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would mean, I, I think, um, more challenge. Perhaps it would uh, be seen um, as an opportunity to distract or diminish Western capacity. But I think in general, um, keeping Iran on side and, and um, resurrecting uh, the deal, getting the um, nuclear program back in the box is um, in the interest of all of the JCPOA signatories. So I don't see them trying to uh, really sabotage the deal, but I'm, I'm curious to hear yeah, what yeah. Kolya has to say on that. I mean, I, I completely agree with you here because, again, uh, the, in GCPOA, we have basically two tracks that Russia is pursuing. And one is the international track, where Moscow exactly is trying to show that it can be a troublemaker if it's, a, it's not respected on the other issues. Uh, and there is an Iran centric track where Moscow is actually interested in um, Iran being out of the sanctions. And the logic here is, again, what would I agree to use, opportunistic or pragmatic? <laughs> uh, so uh, Russia is extremely self-centric here, because what we have right now is a very favorable external conditions for Moscow to build up a dialogue with Iran. Uh, Russia doesn't need to look back at the West. Yeah. And its approaches to, to uh, uh, Iran, because we obviously see uh, that this confrontation will continue for a long term perspective. Uh, second, it has an Iran uh, government which is believed to be most favorable in terms, uh, in terms of developing Europe relations with Russia. And it also has China trying to get involved in the Iran projects and might see it as a co sponsor mm -hmm. of uh, economic projects inside of Iran and helping thus Russia to compensate the lack of financial resources, which in the end means that uh, the only obstacle is sanctions. And as I mentioned, the oil volumes is not that high that Iran can bring, one million barrels a day yeah. at max. But I would also say Iran is an interesting model, if I could just add. <laughs> <laughs> it has survived sanctions now mm -hmm. since 2018, maximum pressure sanctions, blocked out of SWIFT, all of that. It, it might provide sanctions busting uh, <laughs> strategy for Moscow going forward. Um, and we laugh, but actually um, two rounds of heavy sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the Iranian system has developed um, a strategy for surviving sanctions that, that could be, uh, you know, appealing. We've discussed this before. It's true, true, for, true for Russia as well, yeah, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's managed, it's, to a certain extent, it's, it's led to live with the you know, wrist-slapping sanctions that have been hitherto. These much larger sanctions, which are more akin to Iranian sanctions, we'll have to see. And I'm not quite sure that Russia's methods of import substitution and, and just general belt tightening are quite going to work this time, but it's an well, interesting uh, point. I mean, unwillingly, Iran was to a certain extent a testing ground for quite a lot of technologies that Russia wants to use right now. Mm -hmm. For instance, during the recent uprisings, Iran clearly showed that the country can exist without access to the internet. I mean, using mm -hmm. just an intranet inside the country. Yep. And that's what Moscow was discussing for years. And now they know that it's possible yep. okay. without taking additional risks. Fine. Uh, I actually have a GEC question for you, uh, so it's thus, um, the UAE initially abstained uh, in the UNSC in the Security Council vote, but it later voted in favour of a resolution in the UNSC. So why was that? And what, does that have any negative consequences for its relations with the US uh, and Russia taking these positions? 
Um, so why did it do that? Well, uh, it's trying to hedge the, the risks. So for instance, I can add on the top of it that the U.S. and uh, a consignment of uh, humanitarian aid to Ukraine quite recently. So um, uh, the U.E. are trying, first of all, uh, there was never um, an intention to take exactly the pro-Russian side. It was not about Russia. It was rather about its relations with the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the first signal when the voting was against, uh, no, sorry, there was abstention, it was a signal sent to the U.S. that, look, we can behave in this way if you don't hear us. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, just in order to, to balance the situation, in order not to infuriate the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the, the stance was changed, but again, it shouldn't be considered as a 180 degree turn. So it is still uh, um, the, the implementation of the same tactics of hedging relations through right. steps that can satisfy each side's in turn. I see. Can I, can I keep on you for a second, Colin? Yeah, I've got a separate, a separate GEC question. I might as well, whilst, you, whilst, we're, whilst we're here. Um, question from Emma Corey. Is there anything the West, and specifically US, could offer the Gulf states to break with OPEC plus? Uh, unity, uh, or, or more explicitly, um, sign more explicitly with, with Ukraine and Western positions, in other words, greater security cooperation or a state visit by Biden. So, um, can the West offer the Gulf states anything here? No, I don't see it happening, uh, just because um, actually for the last several years, we could see that uh, the market was regulated basically within the triangle of uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia plus OPEC, U.S. relations. Mm -hmm. And Russia was considered uh, as a certain assistant to counterbalance the U.S. pressure to open taps when it's needed uh, for the Western economies. And the market still, continue, uh, st still continues to be uh, unbalanced. Uh, and moreover, we cannot say where we will see the, uh, it being more or less stable and predictable. So from this point of view, OPEC Plus is considered by the United, uh, sorry, by Saudi Arabia uh, as an important instrument. And Russia, which is still uh, one of the leading oil producers in uh, the world, uh, believed to be an important part of it. Though, again, Russia, since the establishing of OPEC Plus, was a cheater. But uh, the very psychological effect of its presence in the OPEC Plus was helping uh, Saudi Arabia and company to uh, affect the market in the way they needed. Uh, and in the end, if we exclude right now those additions to OPEC that uh, emerged uh, in the format of uh, OPEC Plus members, OPEC alone, uh, given the current situation in the oil market, is unable to be uh, as effective as a uh, leverage institute, as an institute shaping the situation in the market, than OPEC Plus itself, when it has Russia and mm. uh, other countries on board. Absolutely. I see you nodding a lot, Sanam. Anything you want to add there? I would just add, um, particularly for Saudi Arabia, I mean, this is an opportunity. They're deeply... Um, I think they're quite angry uh, about um, the, the ties that they um, have with right. Washington, with the Biden administration. It's not as if President Trump worked out for them. Um, uh, the September 2019 attacks on their oil facilities were sort of a big wake up call that the US um, wasn't going to protect uh, the Gulf in the way that they had thought. But, um, you know, w what we're seeing unfold today comes in um, after, I think, probably 10 years of uh, deep frustrations that have been mounting uh, with, you know, sort of the optics of the U.S. Um, uh, departure from Afghanistan, um, adding, adding to that, they're very aware that um, American security guarantees that were even provided to Ukraine years ago have, have proven to be meaningless. So they're conscious that um, what they hoped would develop with the United States hasn't really developed. So they're trying, they're going through these growing pains and, mm -hmm. and it's quite uncomfortable. Um, obviously, uh, they're not gonna walk away from the relationship with the United States, but why not try to extract something in the meantime? And if Biden actually goes to Saudi Arabia, that is going to be a huge uh, rebalancing of that relationship and a rehabilitation of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in a way um, that I, I think uh, people would not have predicted after he's been, you know, quite isolated. Awesome.
and also again, sorry, trying to return back yeah, to the slightly e economic sphere, uh, we should not forget that uh, the United States right now is not only the the, the, the biggest consumer of uh, energy resources, it's also the producers of them. So that's why Gulf, not only the OPEC countries, but also uh, Qatar, uh, understands that uh, at a certain markets it can be even a rival. Mm -hmm. So, and from this point of view, for instance, for uh, Saudi Arabia, it was quite a lesson when during the Abkhaz and Khorais incident, uh, President Biden was uh, calling upon the oil producers in the United States and Canada to exploit the situation in their favor and try to uh, replace um, uh, the Saudis in the markets where they can. So as a result, they, they don't understand that now it's quite a different type of relations, mm -hmm. not like they were between producers and consumers uh, just 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they are not trusting the US that much, even of from course. the economic point of view. Right, let's move on. Maisie, you had a little rest? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that. but it's a related question, it's also from Emma, that, um, you know, is this an opportunity for a reset in relations between Turkey and Washington? Um, you know, what, is there anything, I suppose, the same question, it's always the same question, Could, is there anything the West can offer Turkey um, to get it a little bit more on side, you know, which would increase, you know, this rather fractious relationship here? It's a, it's a good question. I think, I think the answer is yes and no at the same time. It's yes in the sense that if Turkey wants, to, if Turkey wants to be a bit in line with NATO and the allies and the United States, yes, you could see this as an opportunity. No, because of the dependency that Turkey has with Russia, its hands is a little bit tight on that ground. So how much, you know, they would be aligned with the U.S. policy. I think the Turkish-U.S. relations is, has many points of disagreement that is not linked to Russia. Right. That also mm -hmm. needs to be solved. The, 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 I, I see it more almost like a different types of puzzle, 3D puzzle. Um, so if you don't actually solve issues that relates to uh, the, the policy in Syria, the policy on uh, Fethullah Gulen, for instance, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, if, you, if you don't do not look at issues that are fundamentally disruptive between Turkey and the United States, then I think uh, it would be a shaky one. Fair enough. Can I can I do a yeah, yeah, separate separate question? Yeah. Um, but uh, is it a given, Aza, that Turkey would abide by its Article 5 obligations <laughs> if for any reason war to spill over? There are more territory. countries than Turkey only I know. in NATO. But, 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 but I know. you know what I'm saying, right? No, but th that, question, th that, that question assumes that when a country, when Article 5 is invoked, Mm -hmm. All the all the countries, all NATO allies need to provide military, uh, you know, military uh, force. That is not true. Article five actually does not say that. If you, if you look at actually September 11, when the United States invoked Article five, sure. um, it so that did not happen. This was not the 30 countries, or back then it was not 30 that actually got into Afghanistan. It wasn't. A, it wasn't that kind of war. I understand that, but Article 5 itself, legally, it just says that, sure. you know, if a country is attacked, if a, if a NATO ally is attacked, then, you know, all in one, in a way, mm -hmm. situation. So we're talking about what, spillover here. What, <clears throat> what, what, we, what, what you would see from uh, Article 5 being invoked is that a country, a country might give military force, another country might say, I'll give military equipment. Turkey mm -hmm. might say, I'll just provide the humanitarian assistance. Every country chooses... Mm -hmm whatever uh, support that they would do mm -hmm. in the case of an Article 5 being invoked. Mm -hmm. It does not always have to be a military mm -hmm. force type of support. I do not know whether Turkey would provide military mm -hmm. force or not, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. that, you know, there is a flexibility that Article 5 provides. Same as the United States, by the way, it needs to go through the Congress. Sure. Uh, the president can't mm -hmm. say, okay, Article 5 is invoked, I'm providing military mm -hmm. uh, Force. It's, it's not that Turkey's been resident in the past. I mean, Afghanistan, Georgia, etc. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's more it's more seems to me that you know if we're talking it's like northern Eastern Europe, you know, we're not you, you don't imagine that Turkey would provide troops. Oh, sorry, pardon. I mean, if if, if there needs to be reinforcements, if there are if there's a call for reinforcements. Oh, it, uh, it might. It might. I mean, you think it might? Okay. It might. Oh, okay. with, with, with drones and so on that yeah, we've seen Turkey. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. already there. Fair enough. Okay. Um, We've got 10 minutes to go, and I'm pretty much going to try and concentrate on one question. It comes from Edmund Herzig, a uh, friend of Lewis's and mine, 
um, former 25 years ago, just to make Edmund feel old, uh, part of a Russian rage program at Chatham House. Um, Edmund asks us, it's for all of you, are there scenarios for the development of a war that could pose serious political risks for rulers of these countries vis-a-vis -vis divisions within their political elites or emerging from public opposition to their fence-sitting and opportunistic policies. Um, so what Edmund's asking, of course, is, 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 is you know, what, what does this mean for the stability in these regions? We've covered it to a certain extent uh, with Erdogan, but maybe I'll come back to you on it anyway, um, Beza. But I mean, does this, does this pose an internal systemic risk, if you like, for Iran? For Iran, I think it's really hinged to the JCPOA. Okay. If Russia really throws a grenade into uh, those talks and, and those dynamics, um, that could be a game changer in okay. Tehran Moscow ties because uh, this would sort of be you know another injustice um, that I think uh, could let's not say that Te Tehran would suddenly become pro Western but Tehran would look for uh, right. alternatives and look to um, Europe and the United States to uh, find workarounds to save the JCPOA. Fair enough. So internal political instability as a result of this in... Well, I don't see it happening, honestly. Okay. Right. Um, the only maybe uh, say fallout can be uh, in terms of the regional relations. So we, for instance, see, uh, and let's call it alliance, though there are certain let's say, uh, assumptions need to be made to, to call it in this way between Qatar and Turkey. Mm -hmm. So definitely a substantial change in the Turkish position will need for Qatar to uh, reconsider its approaches. Mm -hmm. And there is still a question to what extent it will be ready to follow Ankara, uh, mm -hmm. given the sort of specifics of their relations. Mm -hmm. that, that's basically it. So there's not really any fissures there to, to, to prize open effectively? It's too far from GCC and mm -hmm. not that sensitive, okay. politically or economically. Well, since that was a short answer, let me just, because somebody's pushing you here on screen, okay? So it says, um, you know, if, if, could they be forced to choose sides? If it, if it, if it, get, if it gets worse, and there is a the, the conflict we've been saying, yeah, yeah. If it gets worse, you know, is there, is there any scenario you see where they're, where they're forced to pick? Uh, yes, I basically mentioned that uh, if we see uh, the intensification of a bloodshed and if we see Russia losing its superiority, yeah. which is possible, uh, then definitely there will be incentive for the reconsideration, not saying about the situation of the sanctions. If sanctions manage to switch off Russia from the international economy, I mean, switch off almost immediately, then in this case, there uh, won't be any sense to deal with Russia anymore for the Gulf players. Mm -hmm. So, and if you ask me, uh, um, given what's currently happening on the ground, I see that gradually uh, the Gulf states will be drifting more towards the pro-Ukrainian stance rather than uh, being neutral. Uh, yeah, I was coming to you, absolutely. Okay. Can I add something yeah, on the course. sanctions? Because yeah. I think uh, something that we didn't cover, for, for the sanctions, you know, with Iran, it was not effective and so on, and we did that, but one of the reasons was there, there was this illegal activity going on for like supporting Iran, uh, during the sanctions by different governments or mm -hmm. by different countries or private sectors from different countries. So, you know, if there are loopholes or if, if there's a way of, uh, you know, gas to gold transactions or different type of transactions from, you know, Russia to, to other countries, then of course we wouldn't see the sanctions as effective as, as it would be, mm -hmm. as in the case that we had seen with, with, with in Iran uh, back in the days. So I would say that that's a really important point that we need to uh, uh, indicate. Yeah, we are on the record, so I cannot go into details, but for instance, we know for sure that some of the GCC states, they are basically involved in the money laundering operations with Russia. Of course. So, um, and as opposed to Qatar, they don't have the strict control over the flows of money, mm -hmm. deliberately or undeliberately. So it's impossible, for instance, in Doha, but it's possible in some other places. Yeah, yeah. And the concerns of some Western players like the United States that these countries may be used as a way for some Russian tycoons to mm -hmm. take out their money of Russia or even by the Russian government to avoid sanctions, they are completely uh, correct and we will see whether in the future, whether see, the Gulf states can play actually this role as a certain assistance for, 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 assistance for, for Moscow to decrease the sanctions effect on the Russian economy. OK, 
Okay, Beza, um, just pushing you on Evan's question a little. I know we've got a little bit. Uh, yeah, just I mean, just I'm just asking, really. Yeah. You know, I don't. You don't see this as as a, as a political risk for Erdogan, do you? Well, I see cascading impacts on the economy side. Mm -hmm. It's not directly on the Russia war, but there mm -hmm. is the indirect effect mm -hmm. to the economy, which would then probably pressure uh, the government or the president yeah. uh, as well because of the inflation and because of the economic uh, risks that, that exist within the country. So there, but from the cascading impact side, yes, I, I wouldn't say there's no mm -hmm. impact at all. Right. Okay, listen, it's five minutes to be allotted time, so I think I'm feeling generous and we'll get out of school early. But I would um, just like to, I mean, well, I'm not going to sum up other than to say that clearly this is an incredibly important element, which actually, you know, Russians who have so little bandwidth at the moment are nonetheless being forced to consider all of these elements. And, you know, Russia's got so much, I mean, the West, we've all got a lot on our plates right now, but, but clearly I think Russia has probably not thought enough about this for what it's worth, because in, in, bearing in mind the cascading issues and, and, and how badly the, the Middle East uh, can affect Russia in, in this way, bearing in mind it's got so few allies and so few friends right now. I think it's, you know, one of it shows me most of all, you know, the, um, how impressed I am by, by the depth of Chatham House expertise and how we can just trot around the world and, and, and cover these issues. And as I say, I'd very much like to do this um, in time uh, with, with China and maybe Asia more broadly, um, as well as obviously continuing to do it from the European and American sides. So we will leave it there. And it just remains for me to thank Sanam Vakil, Bezunal, and Nikolai Kojanov for an incredibly informative um, 90, 85 minutes. Um, thank you all, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Bye-bye.